So I'm going to start now with a little more formal introduction that, as I said, my name is Sarah Kerr. I'm the founder of the Center for Sacred Death Care, and we're an organization that is about expanding people's understanding and training for death doulas, we say death doulas, end-of-life professionals, and ordinary mortals, looking at ways to really open up our capacity to be with the non-physical and spiritual aspects of death. And I'm excited to have here today my friend and colleague, William Peters. William is a researcher, he's a psychotherapist, and he's really a very important leader in the movement for afterlife studies. And we've known each other a number of years now, and it's exciting to be in this situation together. William is the founder of the Shared Crossings Project, which is a research organization looking at some of the deeper aspects of end-of-life phenomena. And more than anything today, he's the author of, I have one copy, he has six copies behind him, <laughs> At Heaven's Door, What Shared Journeys to the Afterlife Teach Us About Dying Well and Living Better. So the book has just come out, and that's the focus of our conversation. So William, we met at the Afterlife Awareness Conference, and I was trying to remember, 2013, somewhere around there? I think I was thinking the same thing, 2013, 2014. I remember it was in Portland. Yes, it was in Portland. It was lovely. Yes. And I, from our meeting there, we also met Martha Jo Atkins at the same time. That was a good little trio we found ourselves in. Wasn't there. it ever, yes. And Judy I, Hilliard. And Judy Hilliard, yes. And yeah. Terry Daniels. And lots Terry of Daniels, yeah. 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 I have been so um, excited to be connected with you through the years, William, because I think, and I'll say this as an introduction to people too, that your ability to be a bridge is really, I think, critical for this. That you're attuned to the transpersonal and the transcendental. You've had shared death and near-death experiences, two near-death experiences, which for people who've been down that path will know, that's a profound experience to grow your own grounding in. So you have that personal connection, also, as a psychotherapist, you have the soul connection. You understand the intangible humanness of what's going on. And you also have a strong academic analysis. And so that configuration, I think, has really put you in a great position to be able to write this book. And so that's an exciting reason I've got you here or invited you here and to share this book, which is such an exciting thing to be produced. We'll talk lots about it, but the book is really about normalizing these mystical or special experiences that happen at the end of life for dying people and for those around them. And it's, it speaks to something that is a part of ordinary human experience, but we don't talk about enough. And your research and the depth of how far you've gone and for me, how important it is that we make this part of our cultural conversation. I'm excited about what I think your potential book, your book has potential to really revolutionize how we meet death and life and all of it. So that's a big, long introduction, but I was really just thrilled to bring you here and I wanted to talk about how excited I am. So um, I'll just invite you, let me see. I'm gonna check my notes. I am, I am trying to stay on my notes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, You're doing great. I don't I, think you need your notes. But. <laughs> I lose my notes. I go off script and then I'm like, what am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> if everything has gone according to plan, there will be a comment or a post or something very close to where this video is that has links to William's website, his um, Facebook page, and most importantly, the page to buy the book. So you can find that on there. All my information is there as well. So there should be lots of ways to follow up and make connections and learn more about this and really with a high recommendation to read this book. So William, welcome. That was a big, long introduction. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Sarah, for having me. You know, I've been so looking forward to this because, you know, we, as you said, we connected many, you know, I think well, now almost eight years ago um, at that conference. And I still remember you. Uh, meeting you and you said, you know, one of the reasons I came to this conference is I I saw the description of your talk and I just thought, okay, I have to go and, and you know, meet me, which I was so like, there was no one at that conference that was there for me except for you. 
<laughs> well, I was there for me, but <laughs> but that was so flattering. And um, and I just I would say that you know you've always your background as well. It, you know the training at CIS and all the, the the stretching and growing, always being on the frontier, the growing edge of this field. Um, you know you 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 got this stuff a long time ago, and and so you're an early adapter, as am I. So I see us both as on the frontier in a field that we all know has to change. We know we can no longer do death and dying from a purely medical physiological perspective. We have to bring in all the things that that create, that make up the human condition. And I mean, I know you do that so well with the, the rituals that you guide families and individuals and couples through. Uh, at the beginning of death, preparing for death, at the time of death, and after death. So, and I think that's where we see this melding of, if you get prepared for end of life, as we both value, then what happens? How can we transform this? Not by just being kind of passive recipients of death. How can we bring death into the center of our lives, of the center of our families, and into our communities, and these spiritual experiences that I have focused on, um, they're the high bar. They're what makes us just say, whoa, death is not what I thought it was. And with your rituals, your rituals hold all this so well um, that, yeah, we're like so complimentary. So like I said, this is, you know, I I'm just so glad to be with you and your community because I know your community is with you because they share our values as well. Yeah, 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 it's very fun. Mutual admiration for sure. Yeah, for sure. It's lovely. So let's let's open this up and bring people in a little bit. Can you talk about just in, in the synopsis, we'll go deeper into it, but so people have a place to anchor. What is a shared crossing experience? Yeah, so um, uh, I, there are there are shared crossings and there are shared death experiences, but I'll take the big the big um, continuum, if you will. The shared crossings are experiences where there's communication across the veil somehow between the living and the dying. And it, and it comes in various forms. It starts with pre-death premonitions. People have this sense that, oh my gosh, I have a feeling that myself or someone else is going to die. And they're close to me and it could be me. So where's that information coming from? They think it's, they, they will often say, it's just like it got dropped into me or something. Like these, now, intuitions and premonitions can be a variety of things, but um, a lot of people say it's, uh, sometimes they say, I had a dream and my deceased mother came to me <laughs> or something like that. So sometimes it's obvious. But if you move through our spectrum, it starts with pre death premonitions, then it's pre death visions and visitations. This is when the dying are seeing deceased relatives or elevated beings on the other side who are saying your time is coming, get ready. Uh, then there's terminal lucidity, which is unexplainable physiological expressions by the dying at the time of death. And that's what we see in, well, we just had one in our, uh, I think we can say our North American culture, if you, I know she's American, but Betty White would died two weeks ago. And what are her last words that her caregiver observes is she's calling out to Alan, Alan. Alan. Who's Alan? Alan is her beloved from, you know, many who died many years ago. But there it is. It's this moment where she opens her eyes when she's been semi-conscious and she comes to, it's a terminally lucid moment where she's doing something that's kind of somewhat unexplainable and she's connecting across the veil. Uh, so, it, so it seems, I think for those of us who do the research, we see it so often, we're not likely as more traditional medical interpretations to say it's an hallucination or a delusion. It seems it's too common to say it, this is a something and why not be simple about it? It seems like there's some, they're seeing someone from the other side who they recognize. Uh, and then we have the shared death experience, which I am gonna come back to in a second because I wanna fill out the continuum, but the shared death experience is what my book is about. It's what the primary, aspect of our research is about. But after a death, there's also direct post-death communication, which is the sense that soon after the death of a loved one, uh, the caregivers, excuse me, yeah, the, the death of somebody, the caregivers or loved ones, the surviving ones, will report that 
the dying or the now deceased is somehow hearing what they're saying, thinking, what have you, and answering questions in their mind. They often say in our research, it was like, you know, my mom who died was in my mind responding to questions I didn't even know I had. So these are profound experiences, as are the other two elements I'll share in the spectrum, which are post-death visions and visitations, very common. Uh, and the, and then we study them in the first year after a death primarily, but we are interested in them uh, in a longer stream as well. But this is this basic idea that a deceased relative appears to you soon after death and says, essentially, I'm alive and well. I'm alive and well. Just wanted you to know that. Thank you. And then we have synchronicities, pre-death, at death, post-death. These are these things that as a researcher and a rational man or researcher, what have you, I thought, I am not getting into these synchronicities. Well, the birds were doing this, or the dogs were barking, or clocks were stopping, or electricity, the lights were blinking on and off. I said, you know, I'm not touching that. But as I saw these cases come in, I was like, I became, I was converted. I said, are you kidding me? And of course, I've had my own experiences where I would literally say, okay, if that's you, blink the lights again. And I was like, okay, so either I'm making this up, I'm crazy, or there's somebody pulling the levers here. So these are the pieces we look at. And now I'm going to go back to the main event, which is the shared death experience. And it's defined like this. Somebody dies and a caregiver, loved one, or bystander reports that they shared in the journey from this human life into the afterlife or the initial stages of the afterlife with the dying. They shared in the journey because the, the journey is the dominant motif in the SDE that, that in a certain way, the experiencer, the shared death experiencer hitches a ride on the dying and gets this almost miraculous privilege of witnessing, observing what comes after human existence. So that's a, that we can start there and there's so, I mean, there's so many more features and types and things like that, but that's a good starting point for both shared crossings and the specificity of the SDE. And I just want to thank you for what you've done both here and in the book of giving that structure, because not till we have language, can we actually talk about what's going on? And, and I always laugh that there are so many things in the afterlife world that are three part initials, you know, near death experiences or NDE, deathbed phenomena or DBP, shared death experiences, SDE, after death communications, ADC. So there's a whole bunch of them. So if we use any of those, people will know which ones we're talking about. Yeah. But they do, they help us differentiate. Instead of this amorphous blob of experience, we can look and we can ask questions and we can explore so that the, the articulating between shared death and shared crossings is really helpful. And now can you tell us, because this is really what's been the source of your book, about the Shared Crossing Project and your research around this? Yes, yeah, so the Shared Crossing Project started in 2013. Uh, I had been running groups in Santa Barbara locally. And as a psychotherapist, and I'd had these experiences, I'd recently met Raymond Moody in 2009. There was, I'd been in hospice as well, and I'd had a number of these experiences, but there was no label for the SDE. It wasn't a shared like death experience, yeah. shared death experience, nothing like that. And this whole map of end of life that I've you know, called, uh, we call it the spectrum of end of life experiences that didn't exist either. There were disparate explanations, you know, people doing deep research on end of life dreams and visions and ADC after death communications, as you've already said, and people studying synchronicities and of course, pre-death precognition or pre-death premonition, whatever all disparate, no overlap. So when I met Raymond, he had the term share death experience. When I heard that, I said, okay, there's a label for what I've been experiencing. Up to that point, I was just like, this is a great experience. And I see how it affects uh, people in the hospice uh, differently, primarily because they were wondering if they were having hallucinations and the medical teams there were largely saying, you know, you just, you're just under a lot of stress from the loss of your loved one. So kind of dismiss and discount. Um, so when I heard this from Raymond, I ran with it. I, I, when I heard that, 
from him. I went up to him, talked to him, and, and I could feel those, the energy move through my body. And I perked up and said, okay, this is it. So I came back to Santa Barbara after this conference and I was committed. I wanted to start more broadly. I wanted to see if anyone was really interested in these topics, really, as a general public. So I started a group called Life Beyond Death. And long story short, these groups were so popular. We'd meet for eight weeks, for two hours. Uh, and I couldn't do enough of them that people were so interested in Santa. And people wanted to go more into depth and more. So people had their stories, their good stories, not so good stories, spiritual stories, stories that were over-medicalized, what, all this. But it gave a place for people to talk about what they experienced, what they wanted, and what were the possibilities. And we covered all sorts of phenomena. In 2013, I formalized that all this work and said that the Shared Crossing Project's mission is to positively transform people's relationship to end of life, death and dying, through exploring and studying and dialoguing about these profound end of life experiences, these spiritual, transcendental, we call them Shared Crossings. With that, we were off and running. I started one research study. I actually started the, the Share Crossing Research Initiative. It's the research arm to first to study the methods that I had developed to enable the shared death experience. Because when, as I, when I first talked to Raymond, not only did I appreciate the label of the shared death experience, I had this also insight that I'd had so many of these, I knew the landscape so I could help people have them. Uh, help facilitate them for people who wanted to have them. That was the first study we did 2013 to 2015. Uh, later, I realized that was probably out of step with what I should have done because it, it was fine study, but I, I overestimated people's appreciation and understanding for the shared death experience. I thought I could just, hey, there's a th shared death experience, sign up for the group. And people were like, well, what the hell is it? And, I, and they said, well, is it real? And so I realized, oh, okay. So I took a step back. And then for the last, um, well, from 2018 on, we started the Share Crossing Testimonial Project in which um, I put together a team to study, to collect, document, analyze these shared death experiences with the goal of getting them into the medical and academic literature, which we now have done with our first article in uh, December of last year, that'd be 2021, and the American Journal of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. And the reviewers in their comments were quite pleased to receive this because as they said, we know these experiences happen, but no one's ever done enough research on them to validate them. So it was very well received, which is a good sign. And we have other articles coming out as well. Uh, so that was the goal to normalize in mainstream healthcare around the world, because these journals are international, so that healthcare providers, death doulas, anyone working in hospice could cite the literature and say to anybody in the organization, hey, wait a minute, these exist, we need to integrate them into our care programs. So that's the goal, that's where we're at. And, you know, and the Share Crossing Project is ultimately at the end of the day, it does two things, it does the research, but the bigger part of the organization is our educational programs. You know, we train people. In fact, you came down. I know. I was just thinking you about did, it. Um, our, one of our pathway programs. So that's one of our programs. We have a uh, bringing online uh, some basic, well, I wouldn't call them basic. They're in-depth studies of the shared crossing uh, paradigm and SDE. So those courses are coming up. And yeah, so we're going to be doing a lot. We'll be training practitioners next fall. So there's all sorts of things we're doing that give people, general public, lay people, and professionals in mental health, end of life, what have you. Uh, and that's it, just to resource them and, and give them what they need to, to do justice to these profound experiences. It's, it's really exciting. And I remember you saying once in a conversation we had that it was really important to differentiate between the existence of the experience and the interpretation of the experience. And that I think is a really critical lens to look through this because we can't deny that these things are happening. Well, I suppose people can, but I'm in the hand that you can't deny that they're happening. They're happening, they happen again and again, and they're so well documented, especially with your book. 
we need to at least let people know that they exist and make them part of our cultural conversation. There's another layer we add on top of that, which is how do we interpret them? What do they mean? And that is open for interpretation. But the reality of the experiences, in my mind, is not open for interpretation. It's people, what people experience. So I think it's a, it's a great framework. And I'm going to pause right here because we have a question coming in. And so I'm just going to find, because I have lots of things to ask you too, but let's see. Uh, okay, so it's a longer question. It's about the cultural connection. And um, we modern people believe we're discovering something new when it might be recognizing something indigenous and other cultures have practiced since the time of our shared ancestors. And I'm, I'm going to spring off that question and expand it a little bit. And thank you for who's ever offered this to ask if how do I want to frame this? Because I, 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 it's been a curiosity for me too about the cultural question. I guess one thing is why are they not part of our conversation? Why in this culture have they been, as you say, dismissed and discounted? And part two of that is, and can you speak to how they might be held in other cultures or, or in other historical periods? Because again, they're fundamental human experiences. So why not here and what about other places? Yes, the why not here is actually not that difficult to understand because, you know, you can go back historically and say, I mean, this is maybe a rather pejorative critique of the modern academic scientific um, community, if you will. So, you know, enlightenment, as it was called, really was about making the scientific method the foundation of determining what is real and what is not real. But the limitations around that are clearly this. You have to be able to see, measure, assess, and manipulate in the scientific method. That requires phenomena that's material. Well, these experiences happen in the non-material world. They happen in the invisible world which we all know exists in a certain way. Like, but for the scientific materialist, they, and they dominate science today, and they dominate the academies today, they require a, a certain type of, of measurement that is not going to be able to validate these experiences in the unseen world. And there's something else about it. There's a type of orthodoxy around scientism, which gets stuck on, well, it has to be this way because it can't be another way. Said differently, if there is this thing called consciousness, it has to be created by the brain. Because how else would we have it? Because everything has to be coming from the physical world. It's physicalism. We can't see anything outside of it. I mean, they will, they'll say, well, there's nothing out there happening out there because you can't see it, you can't measure it, you can't, you can't claim that something like consciousness is caused by something outside the physical body. I mean, we have a brain, how, how you know, that's what's responsible for everything. And, and this is where, even though they cannot, as a field of medical experts, they cannot uh, demonstrate where memory or consciousness exists in the brain. Certainly they can show where if you get injured or impaired in a certain way, memory and consciousness are somewhat impaired, but they can't say where it's increased. They can't say where it's generated from. They can't identify the producer of consciousness. So for this reason, these experiences, like the near-death experience, like the shared death experience, when you say something like in a medical setting, well, I'm pretty sure I saw my deceased mother just as she was passing away. The medical community is like, that's not possible because your mother died when her brain died. There is no more after this. Now, I, I, this may sound a little bit reductionistic, but for someone like myself who's worked in these settings for a great deal of time, I know what I have, my patients have experienced and heard, and I know what my clients have who have come back from these experiences needing a good deal of healing from this having a spiritual moment 
uh, at the, you know, in a medicalized setting and not having it supported. So this is to say, you know, let's be clear, our medical uh, sciences and medical institutions provide incredible service. They, that's not, and we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. They are absolutely amazing, but this is not something they're able to comprehend. And in that lack of comprehension, their model falls short. And so they, they tend to um, disparage these experiences because they can't understand them. So let's go to the second question that the, um, that the questioner asked, and that is indigenous cultures. So, or pre-modern cultures, how would they deal with these experiences? Well, I mean, I was fortunate to live uh, three years in Central and South America in Belize, Guatemala, and Peru, working primarily in those latter two uh, instances with indigenous peoples. And they had a way of incorporating these experiences as shared, shared death experiences as just a normal integrated part of human life and human death. There was no reason to do what I have done, which is to identify a spectrum of end of life experiences so I can quantitatively, uh, excuse me, qualitatively first and then quantitatively measure. I did that because I needed to demonstrate the legitimacy, validate the existence of these phenomena. When I was living down in Peru, working with Aymara indigenous people, I would be talking to shamans who would talk about death and dying and, and journeying with people as they died, taking them, guiding them, accompanying them to other realms, leaving them off and coming back and going visiting them the next night and giving checkups on how their relatives were doing. Let's be clear, pre-modern cultures that maintain their beautiful traditions and practices do not have as thick of a veil as we do in the West, in the modern world. So to your less listener's point, 100% agree with her that indigenous cultures know about these, but it's not as important of a kind of the lights go flashing. Hey, there's this experience. They do journeying all the time. You know, I would, when I was down in the, uh, in the jungle of, of Ecuador one time on a, on a jungle trip, I remember showing up at a village and walking into this little there's a little tiny village there was like seven huts there and they had already set up uh s sleeping mats for everybody on the boat and it wasn't even a boat it was like a dugout canoe with like four of us coming down and there were like you know three or four mats set up and and i thought to myself well how did you know that there were three or four of us because you got a lot of huts here but there's only three or four set up and he says oh i talked to the to the um to the village and the shaman in the village where you were last night and you told me there were three or four of you. So well, how, how did you talk to the guy? I mean, you had this is like thick jungle. We're the only ones on the river. How did you get up there? And he smiled at me and he just as if to say, no. Oh, you poor silly thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to explain this to you, gringo. So I, I have been handed my lunch on these things many times and, um, and, and I'm okay with that. I feel like, as you said, you know, the, the, one of the kindest uh, compliments you've given to me, Sarah, is that you say I'm a bridge. I definitely feel I'm a bridge. You know, I can't lead with my faith and love and appreciation for indigenous cultures. And not, I can't be, you know, wearing, you know, that garb as I'm presenting at Grand Rounds in my local hospital. It doesn't go over very well. But I can know that, that, that these experiences are validated and integrated and are sacred in other pre-modern cultures and know that and work to bring that into this culture using the means that our culture can respect and honor. And hopefully at some point, at some distant time, that bridge will be connected and we won't need to, to struggle and validate it anymore. You know, I think it's fascinating your work and your training programs around helping people have these and, and make it more likely to have them. That's certainly work I do with my clients and I experience it all the time. And I, I tend to work with the client and their whole circle. And when that whole circle is talks about and we get this language and they hear the stories and it just becomes normalized in that group of people, it's incredible how much more often, not necessarily shared journey crossing, but the whole mm, suite of non-ordinary experiences. And I really question about 
culturally what would happen if we were to hold them in a more normalized way? Would we have more of them? There's a great book by a writer named Vine Deloria Jr. called The World We Used to Live In. And your book reminds me of his. He was a, I think it was a Arapaho or Navajo, I'm not sure which, an, an anthropologist and a First Nations person. He studied through all the explorers literature, all the non-ordinary experiences of the shaman talking to the shaman down the river, of the shaman sending the stones to find the lost kids, all these little snippets that were in different places and he assembled them in one book. And he said that the world was actually different when we, when, when we normalized these things, when we lived with them and participated with them, they happened more. And I think that's part of what's exciting about your book is that once we normalize it, and it's been my experience with my clients, that they, I'm guessing that they will happen more. Yeah, you know, that is a, um, a perspective that I agree with. And I'll tell you why I agree with it, because some people will say, they'll come to the share crossing training programs to learn these protocols, which I've talked about that facilitate the SDE and other shared crossings. Well, I'm not so sure that we need anything more than the first night of the training, which is just explaining that these experiences happen, showing videos of people have sharing their experiences. And I think you remember uh, Sarah, I think you were at the one where we had a number of experiencers in the community show up and tell their stories to a group of 30 or 40 of us. And, you know, when you listen to average, ordinary, normal people like you and me share their stories, and then the, the average person just says, huh, if William and Sarah can have it, then maybe I can. Why not? And I think that's the transformation right there is that these experiences, which our culture call extraordinary, may not be anything more than ordinary if we just believed them to be real or acted as if they can happen. And I think there's the door that opens up because I, I can't tell you how many people will come into my consultation room and grief and bereavement and they'll talk about what happened to the death, the death of a loved one. And I can tell you at least a quarter of them will say, well, you know, I felt something come across my body and the light started to change. And I, I just, you know, I just, I, I just kind of focused on something else. And I'm like, really, you know, well, I not, I won't tell them right then, but I'm sharing that with you now. If I had gotten to them earlier and said to them, listen, if you start feeling some energy move across your body, if you feel, a, notice a high pitch in your ears and like all of a sudden your vision gets a little tighter. If all of a sudden you feel a hum or a buzz or like an energy in your body, like an engine starting to rev up. If you feel presences coming in around you, if the light starts changing, if the, if the room with right edges starts getting a little warped and rounded, you get a little, dis, so, little disoriented, go with it, trust it. Too many people in, in my experience will take those as signs that something wrong is going on. And yet that's the portal opening. Yeah, it's, it's, it's why having language for it and having research and having it validated has such enormous potential. Yeah. I wanna jump a little bit here and ask a question that is a genuine curiosity for me. Um, um, Patricia Pearson is another colleague of ours who yes. has a fantastic book, which at this moment, I can't quite remember the name of. So if, if you've got it at the tip of your tongue, let me know. Anyway, we were, it's great. It's a great we book. Have, we were just talking about, uh, Kelly Rose and I were just talking about Patricia Pearson today. She's in Toronto. Yes, yes. Yeah. She has a great book and she writes, had her own experience with her dad's death. She's an investigative journalist. She's done a lot of research in this and she talks not just about the death experiences, but other ones that are parallel. And she talks particularly about this thing called the third man phenomena, which is where when people are in genuine, it's usually a situation of ext extreme stress. You're in some remote wilderness expedition and you're lost, or you've run out of food or something. There's something where it is a situation of life and death, but you're not physiologically dying yet. So it's a little bit like a shared crossing because the person is still healthy and people show up 
and resources show up and help shows up. And so I'm curious, in those situations, sometimes this, they call it the third man, sometimes that resource or being that shows up is visible to both people. It's a shared, uh, in this dimension, shared experience of a visitor from another dimension. Yeah. And in a way, a shared death experience, you're sharing it with the person who's dying. So that's a trans-dimensional sharing. But what made me think of this is one of the stories in your book, you talk about a man who um, met a woman and her young son, and they became close, and then the woman got ill and died. And he was sitting on the window ledge and felt her and the son, the son and the mother both died at the same time, felt them leave together. And he didn't talk about it for a long, long time. And at one point, and I, I, I'm, I'm curious for you to clarify this, he then talked to her sister, and her sister had the same experience. And so my question is, do you have stories of shared, shared death experiences? So yes, we call that a multi-person SDE, more than one person sharing in the shared death experience. So the example you're um, bringing up here is with Scott, Scott Taylor, and who's a lovely man and been involved with International Association for Near-Death Studies for a long time. Scott, um, you're right. He's, he's in the, his girlfriend, uh, who is very close to he, and he, his girlfriend and her son, not his son got in a car accident. She, her name was Mary Fran. She died instantly. Nolan, uh, her son survived on life support at the Mayo hospital in Rochester for another week or so. On the, at the moment of death, the room was filled, the hospital room was filled with Nolan's and Mary Fran's relatives. Scott was in the back on the windowsill. When Nolan, what he, his, as he describes it, all of a sudden he feels he's called up um, to join Mary Fran and Nolan as they embrace the three of them. And, and he realizes that this is it. Um, they're embracing. Nolan is now with his mother and they depart, but it's a joyous moment. And he's elated by this experience. Everyone's grieving, you know, crying, weeping, wailing in this hospital room. And Scott is having the most sublime feeling of his life. Thankfully, he's in the back by the windowsill. But what he, but he never talks about it, but he does know Mary Fran's sister very well. And she's open and she's spiritual. But he doesn't bring it up to her for, I believe, I want to say, is it five years, maybe 10 years? He meets her and she validates. She's, he says to her cautiously, you know, I had a really profound experience uh, there. And he goes into a little bit and she, her eyes get really big. And she says, me too. And I don't know how much detail they share about it, but Scott knew right away. It was that knowing, that empathic knowing she was sharing in the same thing he was. And it's important for us as researchers to know, maybe the sister wasn't brought into that circle of three, but she had another experience. We don't know what that is, but she shared in this transition as well. And she shared that with Scott. We call this a multi-person SDE and they're common, um, but you know, they're common how you know they happen let's put it that way where different people have different experiences or where different people have the same experience and can kind of uh, corroborate each other's experience sometimes it's both uh have a similar experience most of the time they share some aspect of the experience but have other aspects that are different like that collective dreaming like when you dream with someone there'll be, yes. there'll be, there'll be overlaps in the dream we met, but we were attached to other parts of the experience. It, exactly. Very well noted. Yeah, and I've had and that I think it's because they are entering into this experience through their own. And there's a common portal, but they also bring in their own, for lack of a better term, 
They have their own frequency. They have their own energetic constitution. They have their own relationships. So they get the common, some of the common experience, but they also have their own experience with this person as well. That melding of those energies creates something. So like, for example, people will talk about having life reviews and there's three types of life reviews you can have in a shared depth experience. So you can, as an experiencer, watch the life review of the person dying. You can watch the life review of you, your common experiences with the person dying and yourself, or you can have your own life review. How bizarre is that? We have, there's, I don't know if you remember Madeline in the book, she talks about her mother being on life support, her coming in, sitting vigil, a, a real ominous figure comes in and, and she calls this figure the, the protector of her mother. Uh, we'll come back to that figure in a second. The protector, of course, now you keep in mind, she is being kept here by American medical science. Um, she's on life support, respirator. She would not be in that room anymore, but for the support of the ventilator. Keep that aside for a second. While Madeline is with her mother and this ominous being is present, she sees a review of her own life and realizes that she is being called now to live a deeper integrity. She walks out of that experience. She go, tells the doctors, take my mother off life support. They do. By the way, it's a large family. And she just basically said, with all this conviction, that's enough of that. Um, and takes them all on. And they kind of listen to her. Uh, and then she goes out and she makes major life changes. So, so these experiences hold a lot. But let's go back to this one figure because I'm going to piggyback on it because it's a great example. So this ominous figure that's there for uh, Madeline's, to protect Madeline's mother using, those are Madeline's words. I, I started seeing this a lot in these cases. And I also had my own experiences where I felt there was this force, this presence. They just seem to be at once loving, but forceful, deliberate, intentional, uh, even a bit businesslike. I could feel a bit of pressure in myself about, you know, a little bit of anxiety like this, you know, about dying. Like there's a time that's just, and it's not a negative thing, but it's a sense that there's business being done here that's important. And it's called the transition of a soul spirit consciousness from a human body at a certain time under certain conditions for the best uh, transition possible. And I became fixated on this presence. Uh, and what I found was, as in Madeline's case, is that it's, it's there and about, I, can't, I don't have the exact data on it, but I think it's about 20 to 25% of our cases. And at my father's death, uh, now a little over a year and a half ago, I felt this presence as well. And I identified it with the term, the conductor, because this conductor, and I think we should really, I think we should really hold this close to heart and mind, because if there is this force it's out there helping us. Uh, and it takes on, a, 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 for lack of a better term, a personification, even though it's not a person. But it takes form in various forms. It can look like an angel, a guide, a light being, what have you. And so this goes all the way back to the mysterious third person. Because, and yes, yeah. because I know what that third person is. I have seen that third person show up at deathbed scenes, not so much to conduct the actual transition, but to show up and be of service to the family in some way around a tragic death or a death that needs help. And when that, that for, uh, we just heard a case yesterday where a nun comes into a scene um, at a hospital and then circles up the families under a great deal of stress and strain because someone's dying and they didn't expect it. And the nun comes in and circles them up and say, you know, maybe is there some way we'd like to maybe honor this person? Can we, you know, circle up? And, and everyone goes, oh, this is great. Thanks, sister. They happen to be Catholic, so it worked. And she's helping them all out. They're healing. They're expressing something. She's carrying out a ritual, something, Sarah, you've done a thousand times. And, but then she disappears afterwards. 
And the family goes out and says, hey, I'd really like to thank that nun who, you know, get, you know, the sister who came in at just when we needed her. And the nursing staff at the station say, none? There's, there's no nun here. We've never seen a nun here. Not tonight. Mysterious third person. And shared multi-person experience. And shared multi, exactly. So all I, the, the I, beauty of this is just the incomplete, like awe-inspiring, ever unfolding mystery that seems to have divinity with it in the form of support and guidance throughout. We have another question and I just, and we'll get to that in a sec. I um, I just really wanna thank you for articulating, you know, your term, the conductor. In my training, we call that a psychopomp being. So psyche is soul and pomp means to conduct or convey. So it's yep. the same thing. And I've really started feeling that too, that we have a kind of traditional understanding of psychopomps that they are the ones who take us across, the ferryman, Anubis, all different cultures have different um, ways this energy shows up to convey us across. But more and more I'm starting to feel, I think what you're starting to articulate and to experience this with my clients, that there's another, I don't know whether it's like the family version of the psychopomp, but there's another force and it's not exactly the same force. There's one who does the conveying and one who does some sort of healing and support here. And it's, uh, uh, I told you a story of a, a journey, vision, um, experience I had of being in a training and the, uh, uh, intent, the assignment was to go to a death where you had permission to observe and see what was happening. And in this vision, I walked in, there was somebody dying in the bed, there were people mourning and grieving, there were medical staff around it, and then there was this lineup of beings who were in the back and they were, they, they appeared to me like there was a cougar in a medical jack, a medical lab coat and all these animal beings. And they were the spiritual team that was supporting that. And we, we all shook hands like, well, you're the radiologist, I'm the anesthesiologist, I'm the death doula, nice to meet you. We were just waiting for this to move itself through till it was our turn. So I think those, those forces are really powerful. Let's, let's speak to Erica's question here, which goes back to something you talked about earlier. Oh, two, sorry, Marcy. Marcy and then Erica has a question too, and we'll, we'll take these quickly because we're starting to wrap up. Marcy, I'd like to know, can you talk about ringing in the ears around the time of death and after when you're thinking of the person who has passed? Yeah. So great question and one that I've been fascinated with and, and studied because I only get to experience this uh, in this way around death. And I will say that I learned this, you know, just over a couple of decades ago at Zen Hospice. Anytime somebody on our ward, now keep in mind, this is a, I worked on a 24 bed ward at a public hospital where indigent people would come in to die. This was the Zen Hospice project. And all of a sudden, someone would be, you know, not all of a sudden, you know, someone gets into a dying process, an active dying process. And I would, as many volunteers, get the opportunity to get up close and support them so that no one dies alone. And as that moment of actual transition was getting closer and closer, I would feel, I would notice that there would start with a little pitch in my ears, a little high pitch. And then all of a sudden, my vision would get pulled in a little bit that pitch would go up higher. And uh, sometimes I'd hear a hushing sound in the background, but that, that pitch would get tighter, a little more focused. And I learned to see that as an unconscious attunement, at least it started that way. Then I, then I got conscious of it. Attunement with my frequency grooving with synchronizing with something in that death portal, something in that next realm. I can't say it was synchronizing with the dying. I'm not so sure it was. Yeah. It could have been doing something there, but it was more into this space. There was something that was like, goes like this. If I was going to be able to be helpful and join in this journey from this life to what lies beyond, I would have to, my frequency 
my frequency was going to have to change. And in fact, I'll say it differently. My frequency was getting invited and getting pulled to attune to what was required to maintain consciousness and that seeing eye in the next realms. And that's what happened to me. And I, I got, I got entrained by this. So now if I'm at a bedside, I just wait for it to happen. I mean, and it happens pretty much every time. Doesn't mean I'm going to have a shared death experience and see certain phenomena. I have no idea what's going to happen to me. I will tell you this. I almost always feel and sense uh, the presences in the room, the thickness of, of the space gets tighter. The, the dimensions of the room change. The whole physical world changes. And my concentration becomes very focused. Um, now, I will say, you know, and this is important for the viewers to know, meditation practices, prayer practices, intentional practices, all support this capacity to stay in that frequency and follow it. And now it's just like, it's like a, a slide. You get in the groove and you just follow it. It's just a matter of being able to hold the attention. It's easy when we're a caregiver or bystander, you know, at, at the bedside, it can be a bit harder when you have a role. I think it's, I, I love being a Zen hospice volunteer because my only role was to be present and support the dying. The other medical personnel had to be doing vitals and bedpans and bed sores and, uh, you know, working with family and, you know, doing all sorts of things on the charting. You know, as a loved one, I always say to people, get hospice workers to do everything. So you, all the, the care of the body. So you can be right there with the spiritual, emotional transition that's going to take place. But anyway, I think it's a frequency question that you're, uh, is it Sarah? Not, not Sarah. It was someone Marcy. Else. Marcy. Marcy was asking. But great question and great attunement. Yeah. And I think it's so exciting how these things fit together. You know, I talk about the archetype of the death walker and how there are people for whom that archetype is active. You, me, many of the people on this call who are bridging people right. and how when we walk into, or when it's been my experience, when I walk into a space with a clients and family, dying people, grieving people, there's something in the frequency of my system that attunes that space for them. And I think you're talking about the other part of that, which is there's also something in our frequencies that's attuned over here. And it's like, you're ringing in the ears, plugs in over here, and then we have the capacity, and we've done the, our inner work, we've done our meditations, whatever, that we can plug in over here, and that we can bridge where someone sitting on the family side may not, they may, but they may not be able to make that link over to this, what I would consider sort of the archetypal wisdom of the dying process, that's yes. this field that was inviting you in. I mean, brilliant, Sarah. We're on the exact same page. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the thing is, we have choices what to attune to. Because I had the experience of my father's death where I was locked into my father. I was seeing my relatives, our relatives come down. I had just tuned into the conductor and I was, oh my gosh, here it is. I could see the light coming down, the cascading light that, that I looked at my relatives and said, that's the bridge for him. He's gonna, that's the tunnel for him. Why, why doesn't it extend further? He's ready to go. I'm actually dialoguing with them. And they're pointing me to the conductor saying the conductor isn't quite ready yet. And then as I'm in this field, well, someone in my family walks in and says, hey, what are the vital signs? Pulls me right into the cognitive mental world and I lose that connection. So this is really important. Now, 90% of North Americans that I know, they're going to be more interested in the physical and all sorts of other stuff when we should all be sitting vigil and attuning ourselves, as you just defined so well, Sarah, to the frequency of, of the dying, of the vortex, of whatever is calling for us so we can entrain with it and be a support to go with them. I don't know if you saw me scratch my head in there, but that's one of my experiences. My crown chakra starts to itch when, when we're really lined up. And just as you were talking about your experience with your dad, it's like, whoo, the ants yeah. are all crawling up my crown chakra. So learning yeah. what these signs in our own bodies are. Okay, I'm gonna, we could talk all night, but I'm gonna bring in Erica's question here. And then I think after that, we'll wrap it up. But there's lots of ways for people to connect with you and lots with me. Um, so Erica, oh, juicy, says, what about after death experiences in dream time? Getting messages from loved ones who have died and want a message passed on to another person. Well, that's a interesting 
Beautiful. Oh, I love that question, Erica. That's so, okay. So let's clarify some terms here. Um, what people often call um, a post-death, we call it post-death visions and visitations. It's also called post-death dreams. I don't like the term dreams. Dreaming is something else. Now, there are dream states that facilitate visions and visitations. And this is how you tell the difference. If that, the, the, the object of the vision, the visitor or the vision you're seeing has certain characteristics like it's super coherent. It is a direct reflection of the person as you remember them in their human life. In other words, they have the same form. They may be wearing clothes or presenting themselves in a way that you recognize as them. Uh, they often appear younger, healthier, more vital, uh, and nothing is disorganized. By that, you don't have any objects that aren't, you know, usually in a, in a visitation or vision, there's very little phenomena outside of the, the visitor visiting, so to speak. Uh, there can be some phenomena if it's relevant. You can be in a common kitchen or a new kitchen. Or something. You know, the setting can be a little bit different, but the main event is actually the communication of the visitor. Your and they usually come with a very clear message. Now, so you asked another part of this is, what if they're coming to you to give you a vision, uh, a message for somebody else? Well, I can tell you, I am that person in my community. I will wake up in the morning, usually in that, what they call that, you know, hypnopompic state, that state just before, you know, just after the REM state actually. And it's a high theta state. So there's something about our brains that, that, that can, I don't know, I don't, I don't go too much into it just to say that we know in the literature, that's a information rich time for receiving visions and visitations. And I often just in that state, will get a message, see somebody. Uh, and it, I sometimes I don't even have to see anybody, I just get a message. Most of the time I see something and I realize, oh, this is not for me. But it's a, but I know what it is. It's somebody who's died or someone here delivering a message and it needs to go to somebody. And I receive it. And then I just basically say, okay, I got the message. You're gonna have to help me connect with this person. Usually it's someone in my community or family and I share it. And in that way, we serve as airports. This is where these uh, entities, these deceased loved ones, if they're that, or angels can come down and land in us and drop us a message. And our job is to, if we take it on, to find the recipient. Uh, now, I will tell you, there was a time in my life when I had this happening so much that I had to ask for it to stop. Because I just did, I was just it got to a point where I was felt more as, you know, as much like a medium as anything else, except I wasn't choosing it. It was just like, I was the only airport that was open that had runway space. <laughs> so I know, I know, I, I hope I'm getting Erica's question, right? Am, am I, is this make yep. I think that's it. Dreams and passing it on. And yeah. that, um, you know, it's interesting. I'm just putting together a course now about those, those boundaries, how to ask it to stop. Yes. And how to be, because if we are attuned to the other worlds, we live in a culture that hasn't taught us how to do that. Right. And we're, most of us figuring it out or piecing together little bits of training from here and there, but it's a, it's a gift. It's a skill. It's like being a fantastic athlete or musician. You'd go to sports camp or music school and you'd learn how to work with these sensitivities. And so those the skills of this is when the doors open. This is when the doors not open. This is how I keep myself grounded and clear and balanced. And this is, and the other big part in, is how to deliver those messages to people in an appropriate way. That's yeah. there's. I'm sure you can speak a lot to that. There's a lot of finesse around permission and what people are willing to hear and want to hear and what your role is and being kind of neutral and unattached. That and you're absolutely right. That's a whole other practice. Yeah, but but worth worth learning to do for sure. Yeah, so we're going to wrap up now. Um, in fact, in this very moment, I just there's my cat is coming to uh, <laughs> to, to be part of the wrapping up. He, he must know it's time. Um, 
I'm so grateful to have had you on here as, as ever. Whenever we start to talk, I feel like we could just go on and on and on and on. It's been fun to do it with um, some folks listening, and I have no doubt there's been lots of interesting conversation in the comments because these are so common. We just yeah. really need places for it. So again, William's book has just come out. It's available on his website, thesharedcrossingproject.com. Do I have that right? Yes. Um, and it's, it's exciting and it's important. And I think it's really, as, as you say, bridging and building these stepping stones to a really fundamental way of dealing, not only with death, but with life. So thank you so much. You're so welcome, Sarah. Thank you for hosting this. I appreciate your support, collegiality and all of this. And uh, I love your questions. Your community was just like right at the growing edge of this. So it's beautiful to see that, that you have a community that's engaging in this way. And, yes, I and love so that I just community. want to remind people, if I could, for people who want to see a little bit more about these experiences, you know, our website has a not we have definitions, but we also have a new story library where we take videos of uh, from our research and then we edit them down. I should say Michelle Johnston, one of our senior researchers, does a great job of putting these into three to five minute snippets so you can hear regular people talk about their shared death experiences. So yeah. Very important to make a space for that. All yeah. right. Well, to everyone, please continue to explore this. Very important. Thank you, William. I'm going to turn off our, our live stream.